Dallas, Executive Director of the Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and he's teacher one. That's Sal Salston, the uh, is President, CEO, Executive Director, Grant Kubar of the Dallas Entrepreneur Center. And uh, this is Joe Beard with uh, Pro Canyon. Thanks for being here. And then Glenn Singleton, who's uh, your IT host for the day, right? <laughs> yeah, all right. So, um, we're going to make this pretty informal. Uh, it'll be time for Q&A with the panel. I uh, kind of want to give an overview of what's going on here in Dallas, and Texas, and nationally. And so, uh, Joe, I'm actually going to start with you. You and I had a conversation the other day about kind of the investment climate going on around the country and kind of what you're seeing in terms of deal flow here. Why don't you recap a little bit of that discussion we had? Yeah, so in my opinion, over the last, uh, I would say year, I think deal flow has increased in terms of volume. Uh, but more importantly, from my perspective, uh, deal quality has started to improve. Um, I don't know if that's a function of just overall deal flow growing or our reputation in the market or, or what's happening, but I feel like the deal flow that we're starting to see is a lot better. Um, valuations have still remained pretty high. Um, and I think as long as there's successful exits in the market, which M&A activity has been high, there's been some successful IPOs, I think as long as exit activity remains high, we're going to still see a lot of volume in terms of dollars continue to come into the market. Um, I think the potential risk long term is at some point there's going to be a correction. I don't know if that's going to be next week or in two years. But when it does, I think we're going to see the large volume deals where you see people throwing in, you know, $100 million into a pre-IPO company. I think that's going to be a very risky place to be when the market starts to turn. And I think it will then work its way down to early stage where we like to invest ourselves. And how about here in Dallas? And in terms of here in Dallas, I think it's, I think it's very similar. I think the, the deal flow is starting to improve. And I think a lot of that can be attributed to people like the DEC and Capital Factory that are around to start to educate early stage entrepreneurs. On the West Coast, there's a system that's been there forever, right? So an early stage entrepreneur on the West Coast knows exactly what they need to have, exactly where to go, like there's well-defined paths of how to find your way to capital. Here in Dallas, I think it's a little less clear because the market's not as mature. But I think that people are starting to get educated. And so now the companies, when they come to me, they're actually ready to meet with me. Versus, I would say two years ago, companies would come to me and they were clearly not ready to be talking about raising a $3 million round. And so that's been something that's great to see. Um, the other thing is I think that here in Dallas, you're starting to see a lot of the investor community start to work together. And so now investors are starting to bring us deals that fit us, right? And so if I see a deal that doesn't fit me, I'll pass that to the right investor. And so I think that just makes the overall market more efficient for entrepreneurs and for investors. Glenn, you, read the, you lead the uh, uh, national kind of transactional group within uh, Foley Gardier. Kind of what are you seeing from the deal flow uh, perspective and deals getting done, not getting done? We'll start maybe nationally and then bring it back to Dallas. Right, so nationally, I think that we continue to you know, see a, a lot of activity. I mean, it's, it's hot, right? I mean, I think everybody has seen a lot of, uh, a lot of deals getting closed very fast. Um, some may be at questionable valuations, uh, but you know, that's not really my decision to make. Um, but I think that locally, I'd echo what Joe said, I mean, five years ago, I was helping companies do rounds. I'd look at it and say, I can't believe this is getting funded. You know, I'm glad you could pay my fees, but you know, I can't believe this deal's getting done. To now, it's, I wish I had money to be in this deal, right? And it's, that is completely flipped, I think, in the last five years. Great. I also had a really successful event last night. Uh, you had a number of good speakers. Kind of from your perspective, what were one or two or three big takeaways from last night? Um, were you there? I was on the flight. Okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I think uh, if I did big picture takeaways, we talked a lot about how our resources have grown. This goes back to what the two of you have said. And I really quadrupled in, in the last five years from your incubators, your accelerators, your co-working spaces. Um, so I think we're at a different point than we were. And I think we have more education and more programming around not just your ideation, but your 
you know, after you get your first 250,000, but really supporting that million and two million in those series A, B, and that's a lot of what we talked about last night, is really the resources and how much they've grown, and as a result, really the success of that. And so, you know, you see probably about three quarter of a billion dollars, and you really, it's probably much more than that, because we don't know, going into um, our early stage companies, We've had quite a number of like 20 exits um, that were very meaningful to the city. And the city's never been in a better place to support our entrepreneurs and our ecosystem. Um, just again, given, given the resources. So really that's what we talked about. So um, what's next for the deck? Uh, I, it really is going on trend and what I just said, and I think what, what you guys just said, it's uh, more resources for all stages of a startup. Um, past ideation stage because we need to push our entrepreneurs over the edge, right? We need to get them from that, you know, seed fund dollars to that next stage um, of success. And I think we're really poised for that. And so we're focused on expanding our programming to answer your point, uh, to support those entrepreneurs that are really, you know, at a different stage in their, in their you know, life cycle. And also focusing on now really connecting entrepreneurs with corporations, and that's not hoping that they're gonna to work together, but that's learning what works and what doesn't so they are prepared to work together. Um, and then the second, helping to connect startups with investors in a curated way. Um, we are getting more and more calls from across the country with investors saying, I'm looking for you know uh, women-led, entrepreneurs in the healthcare space and so I can call Joe and I can call around and say hey you know let's quickly try to you know find a group and uh, I think what I really want is a curated system and very quickly able to yes with our um, partners but be able to um, present those companies to investors that are interested and the more that we can also promote outwardly to investors where our entrepreneurs are in their stage and how they're really at a place where this is where um, investors need to be looking. Gotcha. Steve, uh, UT Dallas is really fortunate to uh, bring you up to Austin to lead the uh, Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, but I bet there's some folks in the audience that really don't know where that is. Why don't you give them a, a sketch of uh, what the eye is? Real quick, I will do that. I also invite you to go to innovation.utdallas.edu anytime because you'll find our whole story there. Uh, or come visit us at the campus um, because literally the four words that we hear the most when people come are, I had no idea when they come. Uh, it's really changed dramatically even if you were there a couple of years ago. But the Institute, as we call it for short, is the umbrella cross-campus organization for really everything that goes on related to entrepreneurship and business innovation at UT Dallas. And so just to give you kind of a rundown of the kind of the major assets we have. So we're one of three Blackstone launch pads uh, in Texas, the other two being at UT Austin and the Texas a and College Station. So it's a co-working space, but even more importantly, it's a relationship with Blackstone Group, the world's largest alternative asset group, as you probably all know. And they're quite active in supporting our program through a variety of means, including a million dollars in funding we received for setting up and operating the organization and more. We have an incubator that is uh, right now about 17,000 square feet. We hope to grow to about 50,000 square feet. Um, we have 27 companies in there right now. Um, about two-thirds of them are working on real hard science-related pro uh, problems and working their way towards some sort of commercial outcome. So uh, deals that are from the life sciences space or the engineering space. We manage the, the nation's 11th ranked entrepreneurship academic program. Uh, so you can be proud of that here in Dallas. We've um, got 10 full-time faculty and uh, convey undergraduate and graduate degrees in entrepreneurship. So if you want to come back and get your master's in entrepreneurship, give me a call. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we operate a small, currently, demonstration seed fund. There's actually other sort of pots of money in the resources I just mentioned, but sort of unique in a way is the seed fund, the UT Dallas seed fund. And my colleague, and now also the 
Managing Director of the Capital Factory Accelerator. Brian Chambers is the director of that seed fund, where we basically invite any UT Dallas affiliated startup. So it could be something started by an alum um, that left us 20 years ago, or it could be a student in the program right now to uh, seek funding from the seed fund. And as they go through the process, run, by the way, by our student venture associates, they arrive uh, at a final recommendation point and uh, we typically write a sort of a typical, maybe small angel check these days of about $25,000 um, into the deal. So we've done that uh, through, I think we're on our sixth cycle now. We're actually going to uh, fund two companies because exactly as Glenn said, we see even at our stage that um, whereas it was a struggle to get you know some companies that might sort of fit even a couple of years ago when I got here, We'd love to write two or three checks this time because the, the deals are there. So that's just a kind of a, a bit of an overview of what we have to offer. Thank you. So um, you spent uh, years in Austin, and there's some out-of-town investors here that certainly know that Austin is a hotbed of tech and entrepreneurship. Uh, kind of from your perspective, contrast Dallas and Austin uh, for us. What, what, what are they like? How are they different? Well, um, so Austin's not as cool as it thinks it is. And uh, Dallas is a lot more awesome than you get credit for. Um, as you said, you, we get credit for it because I actually still, I, I live in Dallas. I also still have a house in Austin, so I sort of am, I tell people that are from Texas all the time I'm by 35. So, um, but you know, I guess a few things that I would offer, you know, Austin is sort of still a tiny city geographically a lot of concentration in terms of where activity is. Um, that's a strength and a weakness at some level, but it does play to the strength of having a lot of the tech assets sort of concentrated downtown. Um, it just makes things happen faster. You can go visit four out of the five places you want to go to in Austin almost within walking time, typically, and that helps. I mean, it just there's no doubt about it, that helps. Um, you know, I, I, I like. I guess what I would say is I, I like to think in terms of, and you all have heard this, and perhaps some of you all speak this all the time. I like to think in terms of Texas, really. I mean, I really like to think in terms of the assets that our state has, and that the cities that are so close to each other have to be able to really give each other. I see Dallas becoming a lot more. Uh, taking some of the good attributes of, of Austin, just the collaboration and more of the kind of a pay it forward attitude that's almost a gift attitude that uh, maybe is even greater now than ever before. We're all, I mean, we're, we, we work on the students coming up through the pipeline, and so we're trying to prepare your first time founders and give them experience before they hit the ground with you. And so the students are getting savvier entrepreneurially. Um, so I think that's happening throughout Texas. It's certainly happening in Dallas. So yeah, that was a few comments. Can I, add to that? Yeah, sure. I just don't think there's any reason, and maybe you guys can help support me in this or say, Alice, you're absolutely wrong, but there's really no reason why Dallas shouldn't be and have the same number of entrepreneurs that are being funded and exits that Austin does. Um, I think that we do have the companies and I think that we have the dollars of investment and I think we are right on that pivotal point where we need to push it over, really over the, over to the next, over to the other side. But um, do you agree or disagree with me? No, I agree. Okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. So, yeah. Joe, uh, go ahead. Yeah. So, Joe, and you've got some entrepreneurs out here that are looking for capital. Tell them a bit about kind of, you know, pro chain and what you look for, size of deals, verticals you're interested in and not interested in. So, pro chain is an early stage seed focused fund, or not a fund, but a firm. Um, we typically write checks sub 500000 into seed rounds is where we like to play. We don't typically lead rounds. Geographically, we invest everywhere. Currently, our portfolio is spread across Israel, Switzerland, India, and all over the United States. So Dallas is just a part of that portfolio. Um, currently, in terms of areas of focus, we spend a lot of time across healthcare, mobility, and business services is where we spend a lot of time. We don't invest in anything that we can't add value to. So if it's just a smart guy or gal and a great business, 
we're probably going to pass. Um, currently, 38 companies across those four countries. Um, our portfolio is pretty diverse in terms of not only areas, but also who we invest in. So we have a, probably about seven or eight companies here in Dallas. I think we have seven women-led companies, um, several veterans. I think we probably have the most diverse venture capital team that you can possibly imagine. Um, if anybody has seen the, the four people at our firm, which is relatively small. And so we are very focused on making sure that, I mean, one, that our portfolio reflects diversity as well, um, diversity of thought, but also looking for companies in different areas. I do not see a lot of minority founders coming to us, to be honest with you. Um, and so one of the things that we're very focused on is making sure that we're accessible, which isn't always easy because there's 24 hours in the day, but providing access to underrepresented founders is something that we are very focused on making sure that we're doing and putting ourselves in the right circles because we all know that one of the biggest challenges for a lot of entrepreneurs is just access to capital, right? There's some people that know where to go and there's others that just have no idea where to start. And so if we can make ourselves more visible and know that we're uh, accessible, you know, maybe we can help solve that problem. So Glenn, um, term sheets and, and deals get structured differently on the coast versus here. Well, what do you see as the big differences in terms of how they get structured in our market versus the coasts? We do all of them. I mean, honestly, I'll have an East Coast term sheet, a West Coast term sheet, and then one that somebody drew up, you know, down, down at the restaurant, you know, down the street. So I don't think that there is a Texas kind of term sheet, right? I mean, what we are is we're a mashup of all of them, and I think we take the best of all of them. But what, I, what I've seen is less about kind of specific terms and more about the investors in town getting better educated about what matters and what doesn't. I used to have a lot of fights over things that just don't matter. And I think that, you know, whether it's from, you know, co-investing, you know, with Joe and his group or, you know, the education things we put on in town, everybody's gotten a lot smarter and more efficient, you know, on that sort of thing. That's been, I think, really nice. Um, the other thing I've seen is that they aren't being driven all by just valuation and what the deal is. To Joe's point about you know adding value, and I see Joe Dwyer back here, you know uh, the founder equity, they do the same thing. You're seeing a lot of groups that are really focused on bringing wood to the fire, and I'm seeing a lot more of deals that are more about who the investor is than how much money they're bringing in. So, what would be uh, two or three things that you think really do matter? in a term sheet, and then what are two or three things that just don't matter? I don't care about registration rights or IPOs at this point, right? It's kind of a pointless thing to, to worry about in a Series C, you know, deal. Um, I, you know, I, I think the things that do matter is, you know, making sure that you've got a plan for the capital. It's more about timing, right? I think people take on too much money at a valuation that they need, or they don't take enough, and they're back out raising money again. And so, I, you know, I, I know that you, you think that I get all spun up on, you know, I like veto protections, like founder vesting, I do or I don't. I mean, every one of these situations is different. And so I like that people are getting smarter about what they actually care about and that the business plan is dictating it and not the term sheet and the form that the lawyer started with. And so I'm getting a lot more entrepreneurs coming to me knowing what they want and I can help fix that instead of saying, well, here's what you want you know, and, and this is the way we do deals. So that's actually refreshing. I, I don't, I'd much rather, you know, kind of help from behind than, than steer them on that. So, I mean, I'm willing, I'm willing to discuss the pros and cons of every any line on the term sheet with you, but I'm not really sure how helpful that'd be. Gotcha. So I was, um, the deck is expanding into South Dallas and you've got a new operation of Redbird. Talk a little bit about that and what, what do you hope that achieves? Well, I think this goes back to what Joe was saying. Really, it's about supporting our entrepreneurs that really haven't had the resources in the past. This has always been in the DNA of the DAC um, to help all, and the word is all, A-L-L, -L, entrepreneurs start, build, and grow their businesses. So minorities and diversity and inclusion has always been incredibly important. 
uh, and now to really, you know, going to South Dallas, um, to go into Oak Cliff and to open the Redbird Innovation Center. Um, it's a huge step, huge step forward for our city. Uh, we have probably about 10 different programs there a week, uh, and it's, you know, 600 people coming through there uh, that are getting the education, the services, and the resources that they really did not have before, and now we have it um, at the deck of Redbird. So I just think that we need more people to step up to the plate. Uh, we can't do this alone. And um, I think that that will start to happen. Uh, we have seen since we launched uh, the number of people in the city and the, uh, the corporations that supported us in doing this. We have raised an inordinate amount of money. And that's a signal that yes, the city is ready and they will step up to do the right thing for the right entrepreneurs. And the time is now that we get together and make this happen in a big way. Um, but we're really excited about being a pioneer and I wish that that would have happened five years ago. But it is happening and it's big and it's important. People need to get on board and, and be a part of it. Say something about, I'm gonna add something related to the collaboration point that Alice mentioned because it is so important, not just what's happening and the, the uh, startup ecosystem on the support side that uh, she and her group leads, but also at the university level. So here I see John in the back from um, uh, University of North Texas and um, TCU and SMU at UTA. At the university level, we're doing a lot more collaboration in the entrepreneurial areas. From, in fact, uh, we have a, a group that meets called the Texas University network of innovation entrepreneur centers and we get together and, and sort of share best practices and help each other where we can and to just sort of highlight tcu's values and vision competition is coming up there's several universities including ut dallas that are competing in that competition to win funds uh, in that uh, significant pitch competition so a lot of collaboration going on at many different levels and like alice said it's just hugely important to, to put the tide for all Go ahead and keep the mic because I want to ask you about Capital Factory. You were an advisor there. You were heavily involved in Capital Factory um, in Austin uh, during its years. Uh, what are you seeing happening there, and what, what do you hope, what kind of impact do you hope it makes in Dallas? Sure. Well, and probably everybody on this panel can talk about that. Uh, with uh, many, many of you in the room, in fact, I uh, have had the benefit of um, actually knowing. Uh, Josh, when he first moved to Austin, Josh Bayer, the executive director, and even before he got going with Capital Factory. So I've sort of seen the arc of what he's intended to do, and, and I would just sort of offer that I don't ever expect it to slow down any from what you've seen so far. Uh, he's very driven in that regard to, um, uh, to again, sort of uh, drive this, and I would just sort of say, hashtag Texas Startup Manifesto. Um, you know, through at every level possible. So um, I think you'll see, you know, I think you'll see Capital Factory doing what many of you might have already seen and, and have helped them with, which is uh, more, more and different directions sort of at every level, both at the startup, going earlier and earlier into the startup scene, like at the university level, where we just closed the partnership with Capital Factory at UT Dallas, and now we co-office in each other's space and have university students coming to Capital Factory to kind of learn the ropes and get their startups going. All the way to the other side, where Capital Factory will be you know, engaged much more at the corporate innovation level, working with CBCs and trying to figure out how they can kind of make that investment less risky um, to the extent that they can. So I think you can expect to see there. I mean, I, uh, I just sort of believe this is my core capital factor. It's definitely here to stay in Dallas. And so if you haven't been there and you're not involved, I hope you, you will be, because it's an important uh, new member. It's your time, audience. Who has a question you'd like to ask? So Chuck, man, I, I can just see us smiling with her. I know you, I know you got one in your pocket. Uh, no, not yet, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else? We had a great panel up here about brain power. Yes, ma'am. What kind of keeps you guys up at night in terms of thinking about the Dallas ecosystem? Okay, I'm just going to jump in there. I think I, I, I've actually been up all night for the last four nights, so I don't, I'm not sure what's coming out of my mouth right now. I'm, I'm on autopilot um, with Dallas Startup Week. Uh, but one of the things that I feel most important in, 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 in looking at this year's Dallas Startup Week is just I've had a lot of learning. 
uh, but it's really our connections and our collision points. It is incredibly important, and it goes back to what you said, Steve, about us being able to work together and support each other. And a healthy ecosystem will drive entrepreneurs to be more successful, it'll give them support and what they need, but that means your universities have to be healthy and working with our corporations who have to be healthy, and that has to be working with our entrepreneurial ecosystem that has to be healthy, and that's working with our um, also our city and our civic leaders, and it's also working with our media and having our media be able to communicate and connect those dots. Thank goodness for Dallas Innovates that now is here that can help make that happen. Um, but people need to get on board. So when I see the city not here, I get a little crazy. If I see corporations not there, I get a little crazy. So those are the things that keep me up at night is really, you know, the organizations and the businesses that we do need to step up because this is our economic future and our entrepreneurs are our economic future. And if we don't get together and support it and make it happen, then it, it, won't, it won't happen. So what keeps me up is who's not, who's not at the party, so. I think from the investor perspective, the, the challenge is that um, I'm fortunate in the group that I'm with, it's private capital, it's not a fund, so I don't have a lot of the artificial timelines that come along with having a fund. So our capital is pretty patient. I also happen to work with two partners in Ross Perot Jr. and Anurag Jain that believe in doing right by the community and social good. So the, the challenge for me is that, that delicate balance between building a portfolio and creating success and you know making a return versus spending time within the community and helping to build something that's better for everybody. And so when you're when you're putting capital to work, you, you gotta try to do both. And I think we try to we try to do that dance on a regular basis, but I'm always concerned that I'm either not showing up for an event that I need to be there for because I'm helping another fund, or if I'm not at a capital factory event because it's gonna look you know big for Josh. Um, so I think that's the that's the challenge. And so when you look at other capital providers that maybe have a you know, call it a $15 million fund, it's a struggle, right? Because they don't have the resources in terms of people to maybe do the things that I do because they do have LPs. And those LPs do want to return and they do want the money put to work. And they don't have a lot of time to look outward and help the community as much as they have to be focused on what they're doing inside of their own firm. Can I just add something to that? Um, as hard as you work and as much as you do in investing in companies and keeping your eye on the ball of what you do, I wrote you an email yesterday and I said, this is important, and you said, you got it, and I've got your back, and I'm going to help you, and so did you yesterday. And so when I say that, you do make room, and you were standing up at State of Entrepreneurship last night, so I just, I see people stepping up and people like you, and I know it's hard, and, you know, so I just want to mention well, you say it's hard, you're there. And so are, and a lot of other people are as well. It's not a clue as to how fabulous he is. It was, it was, as I was saying, who's not stepping up? There's remarkable people who do step up when you say this is important. And really, it's everybody on the stage right now. So, Blair, Steve, you want to comment on what keeps you up at night? Uh, I sleep well knowing that Alice is out there whipping everybody into shape. <laughs> um, no, really, I'd say that it's that there's a lot of great companies and founders in the Metroplex that are kind of undiscovered and kind of haven't self-identified and raised their hand and let it, you know, even the the network and the you know all the resources even know that they're there. Um, I see, you know, our our ecosystem is a little different in that you've got a lot of mature, great companies spinning out actually more mature founders, right? These aren't all kind of the, the first deal from you know somebody straight out of college and so those companies are kind of toiling in obscurity because you know they don't need the attention they know what they think they need to do they've spun out of a much bigger company and their heads down you know out in some suburb just kicking ass right and I mean I know Bill you, you see these folks come through tech titans every once in a while but we only get one touch point and so my only suggestion to the room would be if you ever run across somebody like that 
you know, next to them on the sideline at a soccer team game or that sort of thing, make sure they know what resources are available and raise their hand because sometimes they don't know the partnership that they're missing out on, whether it's from a capital provider or somebody that can be, you know, kind of a distribution channel partner or that sort of thing. So that's really the only thing I guess I worry about is that we're, we're missing we're missing on talent in our own backyard. Well, good comment. Chuck? Uh, all of you have already mentioned that the notion that the collaboration among all the stakeholders here in town that Bill and I have talked about many times, it's uh, radically different than it was six or seven years ago. I mean, it just now it's bleeds out of everybody, just in a direct intention to, to collaborate with one another, to be helpful with one another any way they can. One of the other missing elements uh, Glenn referred to is the Dallas families. They seem to be now making themselves, a, they're peeking around the corner, I guess the way I see it, and with uh, Perot stepping up with Perot Jane, can you make some comment about your own observations, uh, how far they're peeking out, and when and if they're gonna come full force and, and take it as a group that we are gonna make this happen? It's, uh... You do see some families that are starting to do some things on the early stage, but it's hard, right? I mean, if you, you think about it, a lot of the families here in Dallas have built their wealth in certain verticals that they know extremely well, and they have relationships there, they have companies there, they have expertise there. So when somebody throws you a one-off blockchain deal, like it's just, it's not in your wheelhouse, right? You don't have the right person on your team to evaluate it. So the only reason you invest in that deal is because it's your buddy's buddy's son's cousin that you knew from grade school, right? You just don't have the team to go out and you don't have the time to spend on that kind of deal. So you're not gonna take your private equity guy that's focused on putting 10, $15 million checks to work and have them focus on writing a $750,000 check into a technology you don't understand. Um, the other thing that I would say, and I stress this to entrepreneurs all the time, if you want to bring family office capital into early stage, you have to find common ground. You can't go to a family office and talk about blockchain. They're, they're, they're not going to get it. Chances are they're just not going to get it. But if you talk about that you're trying to solve something in supply chain or within the oil and gas industry, if you start talking about things they understand, then they're like, okay, I get it. So start with the problem because that's where you're going to find common ground and then back into the technology. Um, I, I just think there's a, there's a lot of big industries that are here and the families understand that. So I think if you lead with that, and talk to them about what they understand and then back into the early stage technology that you're working on, you're more likely than not to find more success, in my opinion. And we're working to help with that too. I can take, for example, you mentioned the energy business. Um, one of the benefits we have is we've, we've got eight schools working on all kinds of topics from chemistry to political science to energy. And so we're holding our first ever Earth Entrepreneurship Forum in a couple of weeks, actually, later this month on Earth Day on the 22nd. It's kind of a pre-conference for our students, but also for the public before EarthX later that week. And so we have alumni that we can reach out to that are in the business, like Kevin Ryan from Merit Energy, who has his own network, to then bring their network in, into entrepreneurship and start to educate them about, which they may already have a glint to, like for example, the exploration software that's being used to go out and identify new opportunities is actually has some interesting AI and visualization and other elements that are, guess what, coming from the fourth largest computer science program in the nation, places like UT Dallas. So you get a chance to kind of open up dialogue by, uh, by working through the university sometime, not just ours, but again, the others that are here locally. So. Oh, there's one that I think this goes back to you, Chuck. I'm not, um, but you had mentioned just a tremendous growth, right, and resources, and I think also the maturity of our ecosystem. And tomorrow, this is in a touting at saying, you know, we're having a very large corporate startup summit, and you have about 80 percent 
of all the Fortune 500, or I guess maybe 90% of all the Fortune 500 companies with their innovation teams and their head of innovation coming out and working with startups all day for us to talk about either how we work together or what innovation looks like, what our future looks like, what are the trends, what are the revenue trends, what are the business model trends. But when you see something like that happening, we have come a long way and it's happening now, so. Yeah, it's certainly something I've seen in Tech Titans, um, the, the uh, reemergence of the large corporates into this space um, and you know, Capital Fashion, excuse me, Capital One, you know, has been a real leader in that. They're hosting it tomorrow. You've got another bunch of other companies that are, that are doing it. I get concerned sometimes um, that they think of other places other than Dallas, though, uh, and I've seen this firsthand. Uh, you know, I would go to them and say, you know, we'll source solutions for you. We've done that through our TechQuest program for many years. Um, oftentimes, those solutions didn't come from this market. And uh, I'd like to see more of them come from this market. Um, some of them will say to me, well, you know, I can just go to the Google Ventures and say, I want a company with Gartner Magic Quadrant over here, and I've got a bolt-on solution. And part of it is how you make it more seamless for them to find the solution here. I mean, it, it can't be difficult. It's got to be a lot easier. And, uh, a tiger-stitched ecosystem will help with that. And obviously, more successful serial entrepreneurs and more exits. That will definitely get uh, their attention. Um, and, you know, uh, like Joe said, um, don't go pitch a solution to a company who doesn't share the same problem. <laughs> it, it's just, it's a non-starter. And, uh, you know, one of the challenges that those companies have that we've seen time and again is that um, you bring a disruptive idea to them and it's going to be a threat to somebody's, a, a business unit manager and their P&L and they'll try to kill it. Um, and so you, you've got to find a way to protect that. Usually that requires uh, executive sponsorship in order to you know, uh, internalize external innovation. So, other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, Joe, this probably is a question for you and maybe Alex. Um, the number of angel, uh, formal angel groups that are being created around the country, especially associated with universities, is, is really changing. Do you view that as competition for you, or do you view that as a good thing? That, because they're, they're really actively trying to, to find a unique deal flow. I honestly don't view anybody as competition. I think we're pretty collaborative, and we're never trying to take an entire round. So it, it takes a village to help build a company. And so for me, the more smart, helpful investors you can put around an entrepreneur, the better. Um, the only the only issue that I've seen with uh, some of the angel networks, uh, and this isn't a common thing, but terms I've seen from deals that have been led by angel networks that then make their way around. Um, sometimes they're a bit aggressive, in, in my in my view. Um, and so, and, I, and we don't lead rounds. So typically, when I come into a round, I'll look at the terms, and if I feel good about the entrepreneur and I feel good about the terms, we invest. If there's something in the terms that we just don't feel is right, then we'll just pass. I'm not going to have you change your term sheet. I'm not going to have you go back to the you know people that came before us. We'll just pass and we'll live to fight another day. And so, I think as long as angel networks are taking a long-term view of how you help build the company, how you help the entrepreneur to raise the next round of capital, and you're not short-sighted when you're just thinking me, 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 then I, I, think, it's, I think it's a great thing. The list of angel term sheets for a $500,000 investment that have negative control over the entire company continue to boggle me. I think we're talking maybe about the same term sheet we saw recently. <laughs> <laughs> we are. And I think that's a great question because you really identified a gap or a need, right? And Don't so fear. the more we're talking about it, um, the more we can we can in improve that. So I'm thankful. Get it. Yes, uh, speaking of angel networks, Alex, last night at the State of Entrepreneurship, you announced the deck is partnering with North Texas Angel Network. Um, can you share more details about that? 
No. I, I just, I literally, I'm like, I, I keep saying to everybody, after Dallas Starbuck, which I know, you know, to everybody sounds like, oh, whatever, but there's 10,000 people I've got going through 175 different programs this week. And uh, now we've been talking for about four or five months, so you know, I don't need to undermine it in any way. Um, and we do have a vision and we have a plan that will roll out over the next six months. And um, I can just say it's gonna, I, I think it's going to be awesome. So I look forward to sharing more um, in the upcoming weeks. Right. So <clears throat> does Dallas have a very good reputation on either coast? And are we starting to see more investment coming in here from the coast? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, I, I know I can probably speak for some of the other panelists on the on the uh, on the stage here, but I have seen, especially in kind of the growth equity area, you know, kind of the you know the series late A, early B. Um, I used to probably get a call once a quarter from somebody flying in and wanted to kind of get the lay of the land, and now it's weekly. Right, um, we're on everybody's radar, including I know a couple of folks, you know, here in the room that actually flew in for this. Um, you know, I, I think that if they don't already have a physical presence here, they have somebody visiting here monthly, um, and that's really changed in the last two years, three years. I mean, it used to be the people kind of covering here, you could you could count on one hand, and now I can't hardly keep track. And so I imagine those same people when they come to town are coming to see you, and you're getting more of those coffees than ever. And they've probably, kind of, they've probably been taking a little bit down to Austin or Houston or San Antonio. Well, the, the challenge, right, is that capital is no longer a distinguishing factor. Everybody's got money, right? Like all these funds on the West Coast, they all have tons of money that they're trying to put to work. So how do you distinguish yourself, right? And so you've got to start looking for deal flow outside of where you live and eat every day. And so I know for us, one of the things that we market to our partners on the West Coast, on the East Coast, we represent Texas as an advantage for us, right? Because you have such a dense population of large corporations with large problems. If you're doing B2B and you're going to do something on a national scale, you must come to Dallas. You got to come to Dallas. You can't avoid it. And so our advantage is if you're coming to Dallas, then come to Dallas with us. And so that's what we position to a lot of firms. And so what we're starting to see now is our partners, co-investors on the West Coast are calling us and saying, hey, Joe, got this company. We've raised 2.7 out of 3 million. They're trying to close the round now. We think you would be a perfect fit for this firm, and here's why. Um, would you be willing to talk to the CEO? Like that's, for me, like that's the deal that I look for. Um, that's a great deal. So we're trying to build those partnerships on the coast to basically bring us into those deals um, for what we can basically do in terms of adding value from Texas. Does that have any uh, effect on companies migrating from the, uh, from the coast to, to Texas to operate the business with a lower cost of doing business? Uh, yes. So we've actually successfully done that where we invested in a company based out of Washington we relocated them to Dallas, gave them office space at Alliance, made Hillwood their first customer. Um, so we're, we're leveraging our platform and our resources and infrastructure to do that. And on the flip side, it's actually preventing the investors from the coast saying, you must be within drivable distance of me, so move to California. Now they're like, no, stay where you are, right? The cost of doing business is much cheaper there. We like where you are. We don't like it anywhere, so it's a great advantage. And I just love your example because, and we just got in Dallas Morning News last week. Did you see it? I did. Okay. Very cool. All right. 